for those of who, who are joining us right now, um, first of all, thank you. Um, we're going to be starting here momentarily. Um, we're just waiting for a few more folks to join. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, first, I wanna thank um, everyone for joining this afternoon. Um, today, I'm here with Katie Linford, Principal Analyst here at Forrester. And, hi, hi Katie. <laughs> um, and we'll be walking through some survey insights, some analyst perspectives on the future of MarTech. Um, I probably should have introduced myself. My name is Matt Malanga. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Welcome, a News Cred brand. Again, thanks for joining. For today's agenda, um, Katie's going to just dive right into um, some research, some insights around trends that are driving the MarTech transformation. Um, I'll be covering MarTech as a strategic enabler. Um, this is research that was commissioned by Welcome um, and conducted by Circuit Research. I'm going to quickly introduce Welcome. This is the new brand, the new face of NewsCred. I'll talk about that. And then I want you to stay on board for the Q&A. Um, there's some really interesting questions that have already been submitted, and we'd love to uh, answer those questions for you. With that said, uh, Katie, take it away. Great. Thanks, Matt. So before we can talk about the trends that are driving marketing technology, we need to talk about the trends that are driving marketing. So in a recent CMO study that Serious Decisions did, we asked our B2B CMOs what are the marketing trends that they plan to implement over the next two years? And first one that you see, as you see at the top is implementing a purpose-driven brand. And this is something that we see to continue to be a priority for um, companies and, and of course marketing organizations. And just with the sheer quantity of products that are out there, having a good product isn't enough anymore. So audiences are really looking for brands that they can connect with and brands that they can identify with. And the purpose-driven brands really deliver that. And looking at the rest of these, um, you'll see that many of them do support uh, the kind of focus on the customer and how the brands can continue to better connect with their audiences. So things like using AI to drive better personalization, um, using predictive targeting to find the right customers and, and really dive into the audience and, and the find the people who are gonna be uh, interested in the brand, focusing on customer driven, of course, instead of product driven, um, and continuing to support the customer post sale as well. Yeah, Katie, so if, if I were to weigh in here, like these all make perfect sense to me. I mean, we've had opportunity to spend a lot of time obviously doing research with Circuit Research, um, but also blessed with the opportunity to talk to a lot of CMOs. And if you look at implementing a purpose-driven brand, I think the mega trend that kind of ties into that is that more than ever CMOs are being asked to navigate marketplace growth. Um, and these changing times um, with the pressures of so many products out there, a purpose-driven brand is certainly one way of accomplishing that. Um, the second mega trend we see um, is obviously doing more with less. There's a lot of friction out there. Co marketers are constantly being asked to um, do their work and keep adding to it, but at the same time, um, don't take on more resources, don't spend more money. Um, that's a very common theme we, we hear um, from many CMOs. And then lastly, um, CMOs are being asked to demonstrate results. Um, the days of being able to do volume mat metrics or vanity metrics are gone. And so the ability to, um, you know, 
report and demonstrate these results, I also think is kind of these mega trends, all of which I think tie into these trends as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as we talk into, uh, start talking about the marketing strategies um, on the next slide, you'll see that measuring marketing's contribution to the business objectives is one of those things, especially for our, our large companies that we're seeing be a priority. And it's something that has, we're hearing come up more and more. And, you know, these other, the um, other factors that we're seeing influence the marketing strategy are, again, no surprise, this really increased focus on the customer experience. Going back to looking at, you know, the trends, it's about, it's about being that brand that the customers want to connect with. And to connect with your customers, you have to be where they are. You have to uh, you know, bring capabilities and uh, that enhance their experience. You have to be able to adapt to their changing needs. And especially in times like we're in now, where everything has been flipped upside down, uh, businesses still need to be able to, you know, be agile and find their customers and connect with their customers in the new ways that customers are needing in, in new times. I, I, I like the way you all have positioned this and the way you asked the question, because you're right. I think these are the strategies that are driving, that are actually needed to drive um, and facilitate um, those trends that you talked about in the prior slide. Um, two that stand out to me is measuring marketing's contribution and business objectives. Um, I'm not surprised that that comes up as fairly high. Um, I am a little bit shocked that the operational efficiency is so low but what's interesting is is when we ask marketers do you want to drive growth through um demonstrating roi do you want to drive growth through operational efficiency i i think marketers are really being chartered as an organization to drive top line growth um but yet still do it more efficiently absolutely um to your point of marketers being asked to do more with less it's a very common trend and I think one of the reasons that this is a little bit lower on, on the list is when you're presenting these, these factors that are influencing your marketing strategy for the next two years, operational efficiency is not the most exciting to talk about, but you know, of all the responses that we got from our CMOs, it did make, it did make the top seven. It is something that we are continuing to hear and we're seeing that our marketers need to be able to find a way to do all of these things and do them better and be more efficient at them. So it's kind of two sides of that coin. Thank you. Right. So customer experience, customer experience, everybody, you know, it's all about the customer these days. It's let's be, you know, customer obsessed and customer focused. So what is all of this really driving at? And what, what it's about is that customers have very high expectations for their customer experience. They are expecting a hyper-personalized, consistent experience throughout all of the touch points, be they human or digital or both, um, no matter where they are in this customer life cycle or you know um, you know who they're working with in the company they really demand that the business knows them and understands them and you know sees their preferences and takes takes those into account and um, the way that we can be able to provide this for our customers is having a very solid foundation in the data that we have about them and our technology. So, um, and we are doing this, but we're doing it in silos. And this is where our customers are feeling the disconnect and where we're failing to really deliver what they're looking for. And we're finding out information about them we're figuring out what to do based on those insights and we're driving this interaction, but it's being done either in, you know, for a certain tactic 
or by a certain department or you know any number of things but it's again it, it's it's siloed it's very segmented and this isn't going to allow us to deliver what our customers need so, so katie yeah so katie yeah. i mean one of the one of the things we see time and time again is this notion of siloed um because if you really think about it over the last like 15 years or so um, marketing teams have grown exponentially. I think the average organization has over like 20 specialized functions around web, email, marketing operations. Um, the big one this year, I believe, is around um, um, ABM, account-based marketing. So you're starting to see mm -hmm. a lot of those directors. And then you overlay all the technologies that are, have been built. So I think MarTech's up to 8,000 plus different tools. Um, and then what you end up getting is also siloed data in all of this. And so what we ultimately see is the symptoms coming out of all the silos is a lot of friction, a lot of friction on the execution, um, which is why you've seen the rise of the maestros. Those are the global roles of global director of demand gen, integrated marketers, um, the roles like marketing operations. Um, but they also still don't have a tool that was designed take the friction out of it um, and that's that's one of the things we try to solve here at welcome is take the friction out of these silos so marketers can execute better but at the end of the day it's these silos that are causing us um, to have this friction make it difficult to execute campaigns and ultimately make it hard to demonstrate business results hmm. couldn't agree more so Knowing that the customer is the customer, no matter what part of the journey that they're on, the way that we're looking at technology for the future and the way that we are seeing the most successful companies approach technology is by what we're calling the revenue technology model. And the name is based off of what at Forster we call the revenue engine. And that is all of these departments that have to do with engaging with the customers with sales marketing all of that and then taking all of that technology and looking at it as one cohesive technology stack so we have this divided into four separate layers and we feel like these are the foundational elements that the technology needs to be um, that the technology needs to fit into to be able to provide the best experience for customers and again, uh, and I'll say this a whole bunch more times, uh, this really needs to be done across all of the functions that engage with the customer and are part of the customer experience. So the first foundational layer, of course, is data. So we need to bring in the raw information, uh, market competitive data, data about our customers, interaction data, um, and refine it. So then we can, out of that layer, have intelligence that can then be input into our analytics layers. And this is where we go in and we, we crunch the numbers and we make inferences and we can read between the lines to figure out the best way um, that we need to start to target and plan for our audiences and our customers and how we want to engage with them. So the insights there then go into the third layer, which is the orchestration layer. And this is where the planning happens. This, you know, again, we take those insights, we figure how we want to engage with our customers, come up with those plans, and then those are given to the deliver, delivery layer, which is where the tactical things happen with executing on um, you know, the different mechanisms to engage with our audiences. And from those actions, um, you know, we get that audience engagement. We measure the interaction data, it comes back into the data layer and this cycle continues and we continue to evolve and improve and have this cohesive technology stack. So Katie, I was gonna weigh in on where I think the biggest pain points are across these layers, but mm -hmm. I'm, go I'm gonna hold off on weighing in on that because I believe in the next slide, we're going to ask the, the participants to actually weigh in where uh, 
which layer of the revenue technology model does your tech stack account for? Select all that apply. Um, so if you would, and Katie, par pardon me for stealing the slide from you. Please, go ahead. <laughs> but I started, I didn't want to break up the uh, rhythm here. Um, but if everybody would, please go out to minty.com. Um, if you enter the codes 379364, um, we'll actually start showing the real time results here. Um, Cause we want to hear from you, like what you believe um, your tech stack counts for. Um, and just an FYI, keep this browser open cause we're going to ask another question um, a few slides from now. Oh, great. Some orchestration. We're at 12, at 30, we should be at statistical significance. So let's try to get it to 30 here. Okay, um, I, th I think we're at a good place. Um, I don't know, Katie, are, th are these results uh, striking you um, good, bad, and different? Like, what's your thoughts here? So, um, one of the things that is a bit surprising to me is the delivery layer. Uh, usually, we see this as the most robust layer in technology stacks. This are, these are things like, um, the social media events, your website, the, the technologies that your customers interact with. And generally, stacks tend to be pretty heavy there. Uh, orchestration being the lowest is, is not a surprise at all, uh, as well as kind of seeing analytics in the middle. Data is uh, one that we see companies have a lot of data and a lot of tools for data, and we'll talk here in a minute about where we're seeing the evolution that needs to happen there with uh, you know, aligning that data and compiling it, keeping it clean, and, and really refining it. Um, so a little comment from the peanut gallery here, which is um, I, I completely agree with like the delivery. I feel like everyone has that in their DNA. Um, like we know how to do social media. We know how to do the website, email execution. Um, and I think everyone's collecting data, but the challenge is, which is not obvious from, I think these results is that a lot of that data is data siloed. At least I find it's siloed quite a bit. And when I talk to marketing ops or analyst teams, most of their work actually is trying to pull all that data together. I, you know, I would ask them like, what percentage of your time is pulling data together versus doing the analysis? And it's usually like 80, 20, like 80% is getting the data together, normalizing it, cleaning it up. And then 20% of it's analyzing. So I do think there's a lot of friction both in the data layer and in the orchestration layer. Yeah, absolutely. So talking about the data layer, so we're going to dive into these just a little bit and talk about what we're seeing as some of the trends that are impacting this. And Matt, to continue on your point, that is where we need to see the biggest shift and what we're recommending our clients look at for the future. And, and as they're thinking about this data layer, which again, is the foundation of all of this. Uh, engaging with your customers, with your technology stack, you need the, you know, to get the insights that you need to engage best with your customers. It all comes down to data. And the management of the data needs to shift from these separate discrete functions and needs to be addressed from the broader, what we call revenue operations function. And revenue operations, uh, as we look at it, is this collaboration and coordination between 
marketing, sales, and, and customer. So again, those uh, teams and departments that drive the revenue and the revenue engine. And this is new and we were seeing clients struggle a bit here because uh, they have gotten into their ways of managing their data in the silo. But to create, again, this solid foundation, the management needs to move to this broader customer-focused base. All right, then moving into the analytics layer. Uh, again, this is where we take the data that um, from the data layer that because we are looking at it from this cross-functional sense and we are making sure it's clean and it is connected in the right ways, we have nice refined information that comes out of it that goes into the analytics layer and where we can gather the insights on how to best engage with our audience and our customers. And no surprise here, what we're seeing um, for future trends is a continued emergence of AI and um, anything that is you know, working on that predictive and those predictive capabilities. And I say that with a caveat, leveraging AI can make a really significant difference in the insights that you're able to glean and how efficiently you're able to get to those. But it's only going to be as good as the the skill set that you have to really use those tools. So bring in those AI capabilities, but make sure that the, you know, your teams are developing the skills and knowledge um, either through training or acquisition to apply these tools in the right way and use them in the right way. Otherwise you end up with, you know, and we, I know this has happened to me, <laughs> me and my teams multiple times, this great new tool that we're, you know, very over invested in because we're getting just minimal return out of it because we haven't spent the time to learn how to use it. And these insights, again, go into the orchestration layer. And this is where you connect the dots. Um, you look at everything across the channel um, and across these functions and coordinate the efforts for how you're going to engage with um, the audience and the customers. So future looking for this space, um, there are a lot of things that are going to need to be done manually right now. So look for the ways that you can streamline the work and process and accuracy with using things like AI and automation to make this layer more seamless. And that might not sound like a big future trend and kind of earth shattering, but the reality is that this is the least mature layer technologically. Um, there is not a lot out there to just kind of plug into this layer. And we're seeing that this is becoming more apparent um, because we are, uh, we're looking for brands like Welcome, uh, who see this gap and who are bringing in tools with strong um, MRM or uh, marketing resource management, planning, budgeting type of capabilities to help automate and make this layer uh, much more efficient. And the last layer we have is the delivery layer. And conversely, this is the most mature layer, technologically speaking, um, I think at times almost to, our, <laughs> almost to our detriment. But in this layer is where you'll take those plans that um, out of the orchestration layer and actually execute on them. And what we're seeing for trends here are with that focus on the hyper-personalization, the delivery layer needs to have um, an this element of flexibility and lightness and adaptability. And as the needs of the users change in this layer, we need to be able to switch out or change some of the pieces here so we can continue to meet our users 
wherever they are. So having a good foundation here is, is a solid idea, but for some of these very tactical execution um, elements, don't integrate them so deeply into your stack that they can't be adjusted or shifted if need be. So that is, that's the big stack. That is how we're looking at it. Those are the four layers that are really foundational to making sure that the technology is working well together and um, we're delivering for our customers. But you know, we can't talk about technology without actually looking at some of the individual systems and tools that our CMOs are really interested in investing in. And you will see a lot of these that do speak again to that um, enhanced hyper-personalized customer experience. But what you'll also notice here is there are a lot of tools that are not your quote traditional marketing tools. Um, things like sales compensation management, partner relation management, um, sales training. And these are things that our CMOs want to invest in. And this really speaks to how we're looking at technology and at this revenue technology model and our you know, CMOs are understanding that connecting with our customers isn't just about marketing and that it's getting this cross-functional base and this cross-functional coordination in place. Yeah, Katie, I completely agree with that. Um, I think in the past I've always preached uh, partner with your CFO for reporting and align with sales for execution. So I, that makes a lot of sense. Um, from my perspective. Um, so in this section, um, I'm going to cover some recent circum research. Um, we surveyed actually over 400 individuals. Um, this part of the survey is actually boiled down um, to about 150 marketing leaders, um, which we defined as director and above. And the survey was largely focused on fairly large organizations where about over half of them were a little bit more than a billion dollars in revenue. Now, some of you might have um, seen some of this research already shared, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, I'm gonna try to get to Q&A as quickly as possible. Um, we have about a dozen of these um, to go through. So um, let's start with a question. How strongly do you feel your MarTech is as a strategic enabler? So as I, as I watch these come in, it's bouncing around a little bit. It should start to normalize here around 30. Um, th this is pretty consistent with what we've seen in a bigger survey um, of the 450, or even when we boil it down to just the marketing leaders. Um, and you're, so, so you're seeing about like, I don't know how good my math is here, but seven out of 33, maybe 25%, 28%, 30%, um, say very strategic. Um, you know, add that up a strategic, you know, maybe we're at like, um, you know, not, maybe not quite half, but at the end of the day, there's still, um, a lot of headroom for MarTech and fulfilling its promise, um, of being able to do more with less, be able to be more efficient, be able to demonstrate, um, you know, meaningful results and ultimately help marketers navigate um, marketplace growth more efficiently. Um, <clears throat> so this is again, very interesting. When we asked the marketing leaders, <clears throat> surprisingly only about a quarter of them said they feel strongly, right? Very strongly that their MarTech uh, tech solutions are strategic. And when we asked them like, okay, well, what's keeping it from being strategic. Um, the number one answer, number one challenge they said was, well, we have a hard time aligning resources 
um, the people in the budget to the strategy. Um, now remember, these are big companies, so I can see where that might be a problem. The, the second item that came up is orchestration. And we asked it in the context of the ability to you know, build integrated campaigns, build the content, develop creative and creative assets across your teams, the technologies you use, the channels you use for execution. And that also came up as quite high as a challenge. Other things cited as challenges were, you know, poorly integrated MarTech stack. I'm not surprised given the maturity of the delivery layer, yet the pains that still around the data layer and at the orchestration layer. Um, this inability to still effectively, you know, demonstrate an impact to the business, which is the charter of most CMOs today. Poor change management um, is always cited as a challenge. Um, with anything to do with technology and directly related to that is the processes. Um, and so these really boil up as kind of the top challenges that are keeping it from being strategic. So naturally, we wanted to better understand this. And so we asked them, where do you see gaps in your orchestration? And to really better understand this, we said, how important is it? And then how well do you do it? And the difference between the two is the gap. And what rose to the top, which is easily consolidate and report on campaign effectiveness. So if you reflect on the data collection layer, there's a lot of pain there, right? It's hard to get to a single like source of truth, whether you're talking content reporting, channel campaign reporting, and you know, for many shared services or centers of excellence, even how well are those resources being used? The second really pain point came up on the acceleration of, of campaigns, like getting them out faster. I mean, to do more with less requires you to be agile, requires you to execute quickly, yet it remains a big gap in many organizations. The interoperability of the MarTech stack, the governance of the content and creative assets that are being um, created also showed up as a big gap. And what's interesting is, is although aligning strategy to budget and plan is very important, the gap relative to the others is smaller. And arguably one reason for that is because if you can't do that from a marketing organization, it's hard to execute it also. I'm glad to see that the gap there isn't also like around 60%. When we asked, like, what is the world going to look like in 2025? Well, the good news is, is that marketing leaders believe, they agree or strongly agree that MarTech is making progress. So they see it as becoming a strategic enabler. And so naturally that comes to the next question we asked, which is, well, where do you see it? Like, what is going to make MarTech more strategic? And again, I think all this research complements the research of Forrester Serious Decisions quite well. Because number one and number two are predictive analytics and AI. They see those as core tools or core technology that's going to help marketers be, you know, take advantage and actually leverage their MarTech stack more efficiently. When we talk about the customer experience, number three, the notion of automated content customization, dynamic creative optimization, also came um, ranked quite highly. And of the 20 or so other technologies that we talked about, the fourth one was marketing orchestration. So it's clear to us that at Welcome, a news cred brand, that now there are, there are clear pain points within organizations, and one of them is added an orchestration layer. And so we've been blessed because we've been doing orchestration for some time. Um, we've done it. You might know us as a news cred company. You might know us best as a content marketing platform. We've been the name, a leader in um, Gartner for three years in a row. But welcome as of today is the new face and the new name for news cred. Because what we realized is as we went through this journey of helping content marketers and creative services, 
is that that was the beginning of the journey. Like we wanted to fix their orchestration problems. And so we put a lot into the product, help build out our MRM functionality, helping with aligning resources for strategic execution. We've doubled down on our workflows, our work management and project management capabilities to help with like campaign and content creation. We've invested a lot in helping control content and resources. So investments in our marketing dam, investments in um, our MRM functionality. We realized a long time ago that to have at least like campaign content level data, maybe resource level data spread across the organization is very hard to report on. And so we believe that you need to demonstrate meaningful results. And so we built, you know, real time capabilities within the platform. And then lastly, like the need to integrate is a core function of the orchestration platform. So we built codeless um, integration um, tool set that's also part of the platform. And so I'm happy to announce that um, as of today, we were welcome a news cred brand. It's the natural evolution of the company and the natural evolution of our product. Um, so I want to thank you, but before anyone goes, I do want to do some Q and A. Um, and I'm going to bring up some of the questions that have come up. Um, I need to do a time check here. I think I have, um, another seven or so minutes, um, maybe. So let's see if we can get through some of these, um, questions here. Um, so let's start with the first one. Um, should the tech stack be a lot of small pieces together or built from a big foundational pieces? Um, well, I'll give you my opinion and I'll let Katie weigh in on it. Um, I like to think of the MarTech um, ideally as trying to build, I, it's akin to building a car. And you need big parts of the car in order for you to have the car. So, I think it's okay to like customize the car. So there might be parts of it you want to buy that might not be as relevant, but yeah, if you need an engine, you need to make sure you've invested in an engine. Don't try to build that from scratch. Um, and so there's a reason why you need platforms. And then there's a reason why you need kind of more point solutions for like, um, in particular around like channel delivery. Um, but with my opinion aside, I'll let, um, let Katie weigh in here. Uh, I agree. And uh, from, you know, what we see from clients and in my personal experience, that's the most successful way to build a MarTech stack. There are those foundational elements that you want to, you know, be that, uh, you know, to use your car analogy, you know, the base of, of the car. So looking at things like data, you don't want a whole bunch of little small pieces in your data layer. Uh, that's going to make life so much more difficult um, you know, but on, again, on the delivery layer, you might want some lighter pieces for things like social media to, so you can switch those out, uh, as, as you need. Uh, but really this all comes down to what's the best thing for your business to meet your business requirements. And, you know, that works best with the skill set and culture in your company, um, but not too many small pieces. It's just way too much overhead. Oh, overhead. I agree. Um, second question, a year to, from today, what predictions can you make about the MarTech landscape? Um, well, I'm going to make two predictions here. Um, one is you're going to see companies, um, more platform-oriented companies become more prominent because what they're actually trying to do is collapse categories and create the bigger chunks of the car for you so you don't have to do it. Um, that solves problems around integrations it solves problems around data consolidation. The second prediction I want to make is the MarTech landscape is massive. And there's over 8,000 point solutions. Um, well, I shouldn't say they're all point solutions, but there's over 8,000 tools out there. Um, it's just far too many so solutions to the problems that marketers have. Um, I think those that don't have a huge customer install base um, good market fit. I think you're going to start seeing um, that growth in MarTech um, solutions slow down. 
Um, yep, agree. Uh, and as far as kind of those bigger customers and those bigger platforms uh, playing into that, one thing that um, we're seeing and, and you know, that has, has been a trend for the past few years for sure is, uh, you know, having public APIs, having very solid, easy to connect APIs is essential for any tool or technology today because there are so many options because you're not just buying one, uh, one piece of technology to solve your entire stack. The pieces need to be able to easily play together. So companies that aren't providing that out of the box, um, we're seeing not do as well. Uh, the other thing as far as the landscape is just, again, the continued emergence of AI and better learning to use the AI and the machine learning and the predictive um, you know, within these stacks. Um, we have about three minutes here before I believe we're, we're wrapping this up. So let me hit um, maybe two more of these. Um, there's a lot of them. I apologize we haven't gotten through all of them. Um, but let me, let me throw one out there, which is um, how important is an IT background for the future of MarTech? Do you see a dual role, proc owners and business owners? And that was submitted by Julie. Um, well, I, I like to think about it in a context that I think was laid out by Scott Brinker, which is if you really think about the marketing organization, there's effectively four roles. Um, there are the maestros. Their job is to coordinate, collaborate, bring teams and systems together and, you know, for better execution. They might be people like marketing operations. Um, they might be um, a director of content marketing, content strategy. Um, they might be a director, a global director um, of communications. Those would be your typical maestros. You have people who are responsible for um, execution. Um, those are a lot of people who are operating at the delivery layer. You have some who are responsible for the analytics and the consolidation of that data. And then you have basically the people who are responsible for the deployment and, de and delivery of MarTech. Um, and what I typically see is that that role requires um, effectively at least, a, if not a dual role, um, be able to speak multiple languages. They need to know what marketers need and be able to translate those requirements. And then they need to be able to talk the language of IT. So in my career, um, I've spent all of it in marketing technology. Um, started out as a designer, realized I was a geek, you know, became, became a programmer um, and have managed um, MarTech stacks for a long time with you know, lots of teams. And I have had that same job in both the marketing organization and the IT organization. So it's for me less about having an IT background as having a more technical skill set. And I get this question a lot of, you know, where do the front end developers live? Where do the admins of the technology live? What, you know, all of that. Um, IT or, or marketing. And largely it depends on the kind of general organization and culture of the company. Uh, but it's, we, we are seeing more of that technical skill set and those, you know, kind of quote MarTech roles live in marketing and marketing continuing to play a very strategic role in the selection of the technology and the ownership. No, I, I, I agree with that. In fact, I worked, um, at a very large billion dollar software company and the website team had more front end and back end developers reporting into marketing than the IT department. Um, so yeah, there, there is definitely a shift underway. And I also think it's largely um, up to the business to decide where they want, you know, those roles to live. Mm -hmm. um, so very quickly, I'm gonna hit one more and then we're gonna call it a day. Um, should you build in house or, purchase third-party marketing um, tools. Uh, my experience has been is if you try to build it in-house, um, you generally don't have the resources to continue to develop it and um, make sure it actually works. So 
they end up usually going to the wayside at some point or getting replaced by a third party tool. Um, the reason third party tools work well is because that is their business to build those tools. It's their job to continue to innovate. Um, so I'm a big advocate of um, just investing in third party tools. Um, unless you're blessed, which is very few of us, and have a massive, massive IT team um, or development team that can support you. I agree, and my experience um, has been the same. Uh, trying to build a lot of um, tools in-house, just the overhead of it is, is it's too high. And you know, to your point, unless you have a dedicated team to building and supporting that tool, it's not going to be you know, generally delivered in the time and with all the features that you know, your business requires because the team who is being asked to build it is the team who also needs to be using it and you know, doing development for um, you know, these other you know, customer facing solutions that are already live. Um, and I, in my experience, I have yet to find a third party tool that didn't meet 80% or more of my business requirements and kind of looking at weighing the, um, the options there of having something totally perfect or having something that we can bring in now and begin to use and, and deliver value is, you know, generally ways on the side of, of, you know, getting something that we can start working with immediately. Um, Katie, I know we're pressed for time. Um, do you mind um, staying on for just a bit longer? Maybe me throwing one or two more um, questions out there that you and I can you and I can think about responding to. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's one that came in today. Um, it seems that the biggest issue in marketing technologies continues to be integrations. Um, there isn't a single tool that solves all the needs, and it's complicated to get these tools to work together. Is there an opportunity for an upstart company to provide an integration tool across pl all players, or is there someone already doing it? Um, great question. Um, I would agree that integrations is one of the top issues. I don't know if it's the biggest. Um, I think if you really want to think about integrations, um, you need to think about it not only at a MarTech level, but at a team level. You need to think about it at a data layer. Um, you need to think about it in a workflow layer. Um, and then, of course, in the execution layer in terms of content and the creative assets. Um, we refer to that at Welcome as orchestration. Um, the, you know, specific to technology integrations, um, the hot topic is around integration platforms as a service. Um, the platforms that are being developed out there like Welcome will include that. Um, you have to be careful like what you think about in terms of what you need to integrate because some of these tools are better designed for integration of just data. Um, at Welcome, we look at more as integration across core technologies that facilitate the execution of the work um, as well as at a data layer in terms of content reporting, like how's my content performing um, at a campaign or channel level, um, as well as at a resource allocation layer. Um, Katie, any thoughts? Yeah, I, um, you know, I agree. Uh, integrations can be a challenge. I having this kind of silver bullet tool that uh, can integrate all the all the tools across all the players, I think is is too big of an of an ask, too big of a thing with the eight plus thousand tools out there. Um, the other side of that is you want your integrations to be very strategic, and that's why we're seeing a lot of these tools develop these APIs that have. Um, you know, the integration in mind for these specific elements that best need to be, you know, moved from one, one tool to the next, you know, Matt talking about data. Um, so being able to, to do that, again, that with, you know, strategy and intent to the places 
that you need is a better solution than looking for something that can connect all the tools. Now that's going to get real messy. Yeah, it, it, I, maybe in 2025. Yeah. Um, Another question that came up was uh, the survey was completed in 2019. Um, that might be a typo of my deck and I apologize if it was. The survey was actually completed just a few uh, weeks ago, actually. Um, the survey results that I shared. Um, or maybe she's referring, Katie, to your survey results. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, ours, ours was a, um, a you know, pretty large CMO study that we did. And we did do it last year. We do think that, you know, of course, the um, current environment is, is changing some of those things um, as it is changing everything. But we're also seeing CMOs lean more into a lot of the things that they said were the priorities and the tools that they wanted to invest in. Because again, they were looking at um, customer experience and being able to um, efficiently and quickly adapt to the changes in the economy and in the environment. And, you know, again, that predictive, that figuring out where the customers are gonna be, diving into those tools when things like this happen are going to be able to get us information back much more quickly and much more accurate information so we can shift where we need to. So as far as, as, the, as, as the priorities go and what the CMOs are looking at investing in, it's still the same. It's, it's a bit of a, a shift in perspective, um, looking at, you know, more digital, looking at uh, being more nimble, but the foundation of it we have seen to, to stay the same. Yeah. It's okay, Katie. This is our last one we're going to an answer because we're running out of time here. The question is around dams. Are your companies still consol consolidating on a dam for a single source of truth? How can you have multiple content repositories but still successfully manage as a single source of truth? Um, I'll give you my perspective on and then Katie, I'll let you weigh in. Um, you know, single source of truth is always a point of view. Um, just ask the Republicans and the Democrats. The reality mm -hmm. is, is like um, marketers do need a dam, right? We need a place to store the assets that we create and we need to make sure that those assets um, are available as a single source of truth to key stakeholders. And I think Katie already brought it up, like in particular, like sales, right? Um, so at Welcome, for example, we have an integrated dam with our integrated workflows and planning um, with the calendaring functionality. It's all built in. Um, there are larger clients that then have a bigger um, dam, like an enterprise dam for like maybe the entire organization. And then we use our integration layer to basically sync up um, our content to those bigger repositories. Um, so there's an example of a single source of truth for marketers and sales, yet the data is actually also viewed in a context of the larger enterprise. Um, and then that's usually for compliance reasons. Katie, I don't know what your thoughts are here. It's always been my dream and everyone that I've talked to to have a consolidated dam for all the things but in reality it's it's difficult to to put into place um, again especially when you know you're looking at what sales has what marketing has what customer has etc cetera, etc cetera. so to focus on this kind of single source of truth idea um, what's essential to implement is a single taxonomy and that's where we've seen that, you know, not having a single dam, uh, you know, we can make some headway and, and make a difference if there is a, a single taxonomy that's integrated into these different dams. So you can use that to, you know, pull the information that you need, um, you know what's there, you know, reporting is a lot easier. Um, so having consistency in, in single language there makes a big difference if you have assets in multiple locations. Uh, thank you for that thoughtful feedback. I agree. Uh, taxonomy is extremely important. Um, hey, I want to thank everyone for your time today. Um, hopefully you, you gained some new insights that you didn't have before. Um, we'll do our best to uh, try to reply to some more of these questions and um, 
the uh, playback will be available. So thank you again. Take care.